This is my, I believe my third time to introduce Heidi Clark. And I can tell you a lot about Heidi's background and her accomplishments and her jobs. For example, she is on staff and a trainer for something called Leader Resources. Leader Resources is this really hip, really well done um, curriculum development group that um, has authored our program known as Journey to Adulthood, among many other programs. She is on staff at an Episcopal Church in the Diocese of Missouri, where she is an associate for family ministries. She's done a host of other things. But here's, I want to introduce her by referencing quickly two stories we go. that I think are a better introduction for you to what Heidi is like rather than going through her bio. And the first is a bit out of nowhere, and I'll tell you why we're using it in a moment. It will make sense, I hope. Mark's Gospel, Chapter 10, a fantastic story about a blind guy named Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus is calling out to Jesus for help. The disciples, or apostles as they often are, are embarrassed because they think Jesus is too busy or does not have time for that. Bartimaeus keeps calling out for Jesus and for help. Jesus stops everything he does, he's doing, and goes up to Bartimaeus and asks Bartimaeus this and only this. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? And it's this stunning moment in the Gospels where you see Jesus pause in the midst of all this busyness and actually invite someone to answer that question. What do you want? What do you desire for me, for Christ to do for you? Now, because it's Heidi, a Harry Potter reference. There's this incredible, um, I think it's incredible, there's this great thing that keeps showing up again and again in the Harry Potter series. It's called the Mirror of Erised. Does anybody know what the Mirror of Erised is? The Mirror of Erised. Erised is desire spelled backward. And when you look at the Mirror of Erised, what you see in the Harry Potter series is actually what you most desire. When you look into that mirror, this is an incredible scene where Harry looks into it and figures out what he wants more than anything else. And that scene where John, Jesus asked Bartimaeus, what do you want, always reminds me of the mirror of Erised. Here's why I reference those two stories quickly. Heidi loves Jesus, and she also really loves Harry Potter. <laughs> and in my world, that makes her eminently suited to train all of our Sunday school teachers. <laughs> She's been with us for the weekend, um, as she has done for a couple of years now, training our 6th through 12th grade leaders to lead our um, program on Sunday mornings and on Sunday evenings, what we often call EYC. And we always have a great time with her. We've had a wonderful weekend yet again. And she is, um, the reason those two stories um, also are the reason why she is here to us. And I thought of them because her topic for all of us today is this. Her talk is entitled, I Want, I Need, I have. Please join me in welcoming Heidi back to the Rector's Forum of Grace. That was awesome. Thank you, Brother Richard. That was cute. And, and there's a little bit of a distinction, I hope, between how much I love Harry and how much I love Jesus. At least I have to say that publicly. There's a difference. There might not be. Um, what I thought we would try to do today, um, Harriet was asking me, to, and, and Richard and uh, uh, Joseph and Mary Ann, no, Mary, it, it's like, were we on Gilligan's Island was my joke yesterday. There's Mary Ann, there's Ginger, there's, and who else was here at the training yesterday? Um, Keep going, let me see your wireless. Oh, wait, I forgot to turn it on. Let me do it for you. Try that. Sorry about that. They have, my, my parole officer band is getting in the way of the, <laughs> of the, not really. So who was here at the training yesterday? These are some of your leaders, and then the, um, there they are, and then the parents that came in the morning, were there, are there any parents here who were there? You guys, is this a Southern theme? There we are, okay, good. Um, thank you. One of the things we wanted to do is, is teach you a little bit about how the, the program, the, the Journey to Adulthood program, what its intention is. Um, as you might have heard,
heard over the years, it's designed to cover four areas of our lives, not just for the young people, but for the adults who work with them. That includes self, sexuality, spirituality, and society. How our young people navigate those four things as they are becoming older young adults. They're still young adults, but they're growing up and they're becoming adults. One of the defining factors of the program, for those of you who have seen the liturgy that's a celebration of manhood and womanhood, by virtue of how our bodies are made, there comes a time when we are able to be co-creators with God, where we can make babies. But that's not the only thing we can make. The young people can generate a lot of wonder, a lot of creative creativity. They bring a lot of things to the world as young people. And so we try to talk to them about harnessing this creative energy into something else because just because you can do that does not make you an adult. Adulthood is something that you have to earn. And we talk about earning adulthood across this program. One of the things we also learn about as you're exploring different ways to be with young people and with each other is a distinction between what is a program and what is a practice. And in this program, The Journey to Adulthood, what we hope to be doing is teaching practices. We may be talking about a specific thing, but we hope that what it does is, is puts in you a seed of something else that becomes something you revisit throughout your life. A program is kind of a short-term, tangible event. It's a thing, something that you kind of come across and take care of, and you do it, and it's fine. But we'd like to think that a practice is more like a comma. A practice is like a page that you turn, something that you will come across again and again throughout your life, something that links what might be considered bricks. The practice is the mortar. And in this, in this program, the lesson plans are like bricks. They're little things that we put out in front of our communities in these circles of trust with young people. And then the mortar is the way that we hold them all together with prayer, with hope, with affirmation and awe. They're really amazing. These teenagers are really amazing. And today's lesson plan is something that introduces to you one of the programs that we use to, to develop a practice with our young people. And I found that when you look at this with adults, the practice that you engage is self-talk, inner dialogue because as I ask you to start going through this exercise, you are going to hear yourself saying all kinds of crazy things in your mind. Excuses, um, justifications for why you do things, um, kind of explanations for, well, I did, but not really. Well, kind of, I don't know. You know you'll, you'll, you'll hear yourself doing that. Um, I wanna make sure you understand that this exercise is not for shaming anybody. It's not to make you second guess your acquisition of goods or to to wonder if maybe I have too much stuff and I should give it all away. Um, one of the things that the young people point out when we tell them the story about Jesus and the rich young ruler is when the, he says, what do I have to do? And he says, go and, you know, go and sell your positions. He goes off and he's kind of bummed, but they never tell us what he actually does. does. Maybe he went off and did that and rejoined them. Maybe he didn't. Maybe he met him halfway. Maybe he had the same internal dialogue that we have every time someone hands us a pledge card. Okay, let's start with 10%. Anything above 10% is considered charity, but 10% is really the minimum. Go, right? So then we're starting, okay, before taxes or after taxes? And does my, in does my investment income count, or is it just my, you know, we start doing all that monkey math, right? It's okay, I'm just saying, it's in the Bible. The rich young ruler went off and did that exact thing. He called his tax accountant, and they figured it out. Um, so what I want you to do is take out this worksheet that you have in front of you. It's called uh, Personal Inventory. And I am going to give you permission to add. You will see. Does everyone have one and does everyone have a writing utensil? What I want you to notice is there are items lifted in, listed in the left-hand column. These are items of things that you might have. You might need them. You might want them. You might not want them. You might not need them. And you might have 10 of them. It just depends. I want you to give yourself permission in the far right-hand side, that little white edge of your column, I want you to draw a big asterisk next to I have. And as you're going down this list, I want you to write little notes to yourself. For example,
example. The first one, I would say, um, more than three shirts or blouses, I need five. I want 10. I have probably 30, right? So my little asterisk is going to be, but none of them are the ones I really want, right? Like the new ones in the store. So I want you to go ahead and give yourself permission to, um, I have maybe an iPad or tablet, and my asterisk might be, and it's really bothering me. I really wish I didn't have it, or I don't know how it works, or any sort of thing that you have. I'm going to give you about 15 minutes just to go over this. This is not a test. This will not be graded. Um, so I want you to do the best that you can to tell your own truth as best as you can. We'll do a little bit of reflection on this. Um, don't overthink it, but do you take it seriously. Just kind of think about how much you really need these things. Does anyone have any questions? You got it? Go. Did anything surprise you? Yes. Oh, hold on. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. Check. Did you all hear that? It's surprising that for a number of the items, you can't even really count how many you have. But that was frustrating. And tell me what you said. Oh, surprised by how much I have. Yeah. We kind of take our stuff for granted sometimes. What else? How yes. How much my needs have changed over what I want and what I need. Oh. From mm -hmm. years ago. Okay. Yeah. How much her views have changed over what she wants and what she needs. I think there's a time in our lives when we think we need a lot of stuff, and then we get to a time where we realize maybe not. What else? It's good. Yes? Well, I'm just the setup, so I might just want to identify because I'm just But the shift between like material goods and spiritual needs and then the basics of what, you know, like a healthy meal. And so mm -hmm. then, you know, when I'm going along, I start with clothes and makeup and then I get to, you know, a relationship with God or protein. Uh -huh. The different types of things. Uh -huh. Okay. Good. Good. What else? Yes? Some things that I have, I want more of. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. And it's interesting how doing this, I'm in Puerto Rico some, and, and some of the stuff that we take for granted, like indoor plumbing or like protein with every meal, you know, they might have a lot of blouses and they have a Burger King and they have, you know, kind of other things, but some of the more essentials that in our lives everyone has. In a lot of places everyone doesn't have, so good. When we're with young people, we like to ask the question, and I think I would like to ask you the same question. Is there anything on your list that you have that increases your value as a person? It's not a rhetorical question. There <laughs> Well, for example, if you have a college education that has called you into a life of work that builds the world in some way, I mean, I, I believe that your lives have value. Um, and I believe that there might be some things that have built, built some of that or were the foundation of some of the value that your life now has. That's for you to decide if your life has value and if any of this stuff helps it. Where we sometimes trip is it sometimes isn't the things we thought it was. It might not be the car 
wait, well, it might be the car. Um, <laughs> it, might, <laughs> it might not be the University of Alabama, but it might be. <laughs> um, so, so there might be some things. With our young people, there really is this, this feeling sometimes, and even with adults, that if I had the right fill in the blank, I would be better. Not my life would be better. We might think there are conveniences, but maybe I would be, people would think better of me if I had these other things. And so when you kind of look at, when you walk into someone's house, I think for the most part we have this flipped thing. I'm not sure why we do this as humans, but we think that if someone came into our house right now, they would be so disgusted by the stack of mail on the front hall table and the unmade beds and the pillows out of place and the dishes in the sink that they would just, they would be horrified. They wouldn't be my friend anymore. But we know that when we go into someone else's house, we don't even see that. We don't. We go in, we sit down, we we're thankful for whatever beverage. If you have to move something off the couch, including a child to sit down, we just don't, we don't see that. But we're so worried that other people do. But you worry about it with yourself, I think. <laughs> That's good. Um, I saw a guy, call, there was a guy called Tony Campolo who was really famous three, 30 years ago, I think. And he had this wonderful series about stuff. Um, and he was talking to people about lightening your load of stuff, kind of your materialism. And, and people were really, because he gave them permission to tell the truth, they would say, I think that you're right, that I do need to get rid of some of my stuff, but if I got rid of my book collection, I think I would die. And he said, well, then don't give away your book collection. <laughs> you know, but find ways to think about it. And I thought that was kind of important because it's, it's okay to be kind of stuck on some things. We're sentimental people, we're nostalgic. That's, that's very different. Um, but it's those other things. Um, an expression your homie uses is shooting all over yourself. We tend to should all over ourselves and all over others. If there is that stack of magazines and periodicals and alumni mail that you're going to read someday, and every time you walk by it, it's like a stick in your eye. You know, it's like poke, poke. Cause you're, uh, and that thing you're going to do in the dining room. And that, you know, wiping off the dashboard of your car, for heaven's sake. You know? Um, <laughs> Sometimes you need to pay attention to that sort of poke, poke. We had a gospel lesson a couple of weeks ago about the gentleman who had more than he needed, and he realized he needed bigger barns, right? Do you remember the story? So he tears down all of his silos and builds even bigger ones. And Father Nathaniel, um, who's at my parish, was talking to the children about this. And, and we decided that it's not so much that, ha it, it doesn't say anywhere in that story that having a lot of stuff is bad. It doesn't. Having stuff is great. You work hard for it, especially if you share it with others. You know, if you have it, if you tend to it, if you model for other people to be productive and caring and organized or whatever those values are that you like. Um, but the, the thing is, if I have all that I need then, and then I get more, the lesson is probably you don't need more than, than that, like to give that away. Father Nathaniel had a $2 bill in his wallet and he said he's carried it around forever, it gives him luck and he just really treasures that. And, and then he, came, he went to a store that had um, $2 bills and change and he was so excited, he got a couple more and he put them in his wallet. And then he was somewhere else and, and he got some more and he actually took them home and put them on his dresser. And then he realized he, he just wanted that one. That one was really all he needed. So he brought all these $2 bills to the children's, um, to the part of the children's story in our time together, and he gave them all a $2 bill. And he just said, I hope that you'll treasure this as much as I do. Because he didn't, he didn't go home and build a box and put all these extra things in it. And so some of, some of, our, some of how we feel connected to our stuff um, is, is, I think, legitimate, and some of it we're just not thinking it through. So this gives you an opportunity to practice thinking about the stuff that you have and how important is it. And I do want to go back to your comment about things like time with God, time with friends, time alone, um, silence. Do you have silence in your life? We might go through this exercise and say, no, 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 or I, I want more, I want more, and then we walk away and we don't do anything about it. So I'd like you to go back and look at your list. If there's something that, that you think will add value to your interior life, not just your exterior life, but to your interior life. If there's something that, you really, that might have surprised you, that you identified, I want more of this, silence or time with my friends or whatever it was, and then I want you to tell the person next to you one action step you can take 
to create more of that in your life. Do you understand the assignment? Yes? Go. Now, you know, how, have, have you ever owed somebody $5? You owe them money? Have you ever owed somebody money? You've owed somebody money. And when you see them, you kind of divert your eyes, right, if you don't have the money? You all have created an accountability friend in this room right now. And next week when you see them, you ask them how their plan is going. I mean it. You got it? That's your assignment. When you see them, you ask them, so did you turn off the TV? So did you start writing in your journal? Whatever it is you guys were plotting and scheming out there. This is not just talk, this is action. Now there are two people that I want to say a little uh, something about regarding stuff and then I see that your people are coming in in their costumes for church. So um, the, the first one is a woman called Madame Blueberry. Madame Blueberry is one of the actors in the VeggieTales series and, and um, she's a blueberry but we are okay with that. Um, and she's, she's in this program where they're talking about stuff. And a thing called Stuff Mart is built in her town. And Stuff Mart, there's even this song, it has this angelic sound, and helicopters are lowering goods through the ceiling, and people are pushing carts full of stuff out of Stuff Mart. And Madame Blueberry gets the bug, and she just keeps buying stuff and buying stuff. And one of my favorite lines of Madame Blueberry's is, her friends are concerned. Bob the Tomato and Larry the Cucumber are concerned about Madame Blueberry acquiring so much stuff because her house is about to collapse. And they, they very con concernedly, they came to her house and they said, Madame Blueberry, how much stuff do you need? And she thought for a minute and she said, well, how much stuff is there? <laughs> and I really liked that. So I thought that might be what I... And another um, exalted woman in our life of saints is Jillian of Norwich. Not a blueberry, but she, um, there's a quote here, it's kind of thick, but I would like to read it out loud because if you pause in the right places, it makes a little more sense. I'd like to read that out loud and think about what that has to do with our lives, our value, our stuff. This is from her fifth vision. She wrote, I saw that our courteous Lord is to us everything that is good and comfortable for us. He is our clothing, which for love enwraps us, holds us and all encloses us because of his tender love so that he may never leave us. And so, in this showing, I saw that he is to us everything that is good. Also in this revelation, he showed me a little thing the size of a hazelnut in the palm of my hand, and it was round as a ball. I looked at it with the eye of my understanding and thought, what can this be? And it was generally answered thus, it is all that is made. I marveled at how it could continue because it seemed to me it could suddenly have sunk into nothingness because of its littleness. And I was answered in my understanding, it continueth and always shall because God loveth it. And in this way, everything hath its being by the love of God. In this little thing, I saw three characteristics. The first is that God made it. The second is that God loves it. And the third is that God keeps it. But what did I observe in that? Truly the maker, the lover, and the keeper. For until I am in essence one to him, I can never have full rest nor true joy. That is to say, until I am made so fast to him that there is absolutely nothing that is created separating my God and myself. It is necessary to have awareness of the littleness of created things and to set at naught everything that is created in order to love and have God who is uncreated. That's the end of her thought written in 1342. I like how that encapsulates some of what we've been hearing in our hearts and in our self-talk probably about stuff, about things, what God creates, what God holds, and how God loves us ultimately.
taking my time. I wanted to close today with a prayer from Meister Eckhart, who wrote something that I have on a note up here somewhere. Here it is. Okay. The Lord be with you. God, we pray for the whole world. Bid this very earth to become a heaven. We pray especially to be freed from the sin of greediness. We pray to recognize others who are in need, for there is no such thing as my bread. All bread is ours and is given to me, to others through me, and to me through others. For not only bread, but all things necessary for sustenance in this life are given on loan to us, with us, and because of others, for others, and to us. Thank you, God, for all you give us, for all we desire, for being near us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good. Yeah. Go to church. <laughs> Is that the benediction? <laughs> That's the benediction for adults.